Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're taking a look at this thing, which uh, doesn't have a name as far as I'm aware, um, but this is one of the boards that was used for the 28 core uh, unlocked uh, overclockable Xeon demo that, uh, in well, not much of a demo, more, more a distraction from Threadripper 2, but... Yeah, I, I don't know wh what they're actually planning, if this is going retail or anything, but we are going to take a look at this board because it is insane. And huge thanks to Paul from Paul's Hardware for actually sending in the pictures of this, um, because this is one very, very special motherboard right here. Um, so before we get into the VRM... Um, actually, no, let's start with the VRM, because that's really the highlight of the, uh, this, this entire thing. Um, this giant line of phases up here is the VCC in. Before that, this video is brought to you by the CableMod Vertical GPU Adapter, a universal kit that lets you add a vertical GPU mount to almost any enclosure. The Vertical GPU Adapter positions video cards further back from the glass than most stock vertical GPU mounts, aiding in thermals, and also easily sockets into the PCIe expansion slots of compatible cases. The adapter kit is brand new and makes it easy to show off video cards even in cases that don't include a stock vertical GPU mount. Learn more at the link in the description below. And I'm not going to count these out here because there is 28 of them and it would take a while. But So this is a 28 phase as far as the inductors and the power stages go. So you have 28 inductors and you have 28 power stages, but I do not know if it actually interleaves 28 phases. On this side of the board, there are evidently no quadruplers, but they may be located on the back of the board. I just don't know. Um, if it does run quadruplers, then it'll be International Rectifier 3599s, because those are a really small, compact quadrupling chip that works with International Rectifier parts very, very well. Like, technically speaking, you can use it with other chips as well, but... If you're using International Rectifier power stages and international and an IR voltage controller, then it just makes sense to go with IR quadruplers. So the voltage controller is this chip right here, which is a 35201. Uh, and that is, it goes up to eight phases. Uh, it supports plus two as an option, so you can also run it as a plus one. Um, but it has to stay eight phases total, so you can do like a six plus two or a six or a seven plus one, and you can of course do any phase count lower than that. Here it is configured for a seven plus zero, um, and then I don't know about the the quadrupling situation. Now the actual power stages in the VRM right here are International Rectifier thirty five fifty sixes. Now these are not the most powerful power stages that uh, you can buy from International Rectifier. These are just fifty amps, whereas they do make a 5555, uh, 3555, which is a 60 amp part. But Gigabyte has seemingly a huge amount of 3556s because they've been using them on high end boards since X99. So I assume they just bought like a ton of them in bulk and they've been just, and, and so they just use them everywhere um, for their high end boards. And, you know, it's, it's really not a problem that this is just a 50 amp part when you have 28 phases. Though interestingly enough, this crazy phase count is not the highest phase count um, with the most powerful power stage that even Gigabyte has made. Gigabyte has actually in the past made a motherboard with a 32 phase V-Core and 3555s or the 3555's predecessor, which was the 3550. I'm not 100% certain about that right now. Um, but, so this isn't the highest phase count motherboard that Gigabyte has ever made, but it is the most powerful VRM that Gigabyte has ever put on a board, and the reason is simple, because while they did make a 32 phase VRM in the past, and that was a Z77 board, so yeah, that's right, Gigabyte decided that a 4 core Intel i7 3700, uh, 3770K really needed a, a 32 phase VRM with 60 amp power stages, but Nonetheless, that VRM is actually weaker than this one for a very, very simple reason. In order to accommodate that one onto an ATX motherboard, Gigabyte had 16 phases on one side of the board, and then on the other back side of the board, they had 
uh, another 16 phases. So you basically had a power stage PCB power stage sandwich, which is completely uncoolable if you actually want to use the full capa power capabilities of each of the power stages, because each power stage at 60 amps output would produce uh, around 12 watts of heat. And basically you'd have a little 24 watt, you know, 24 watt heater sandwiching the, the, the PCB in this footprint. And there was, since half the VRM was on the back of the board, there's only a heatsink on the other side and it would be completely uncoolable. Which is why on this board, you know, you get the monstrous heatsink right here, but also why the VRM is actually like crammed uh, onto the same size uh, like it is here. Because there have been boards where they've done 28 phases, 24 phases, 28 phases, 32 phases. It's been done before, but it's never actually been done in a functional way where the board could actually max out all of its phases. It was done more as a, you know, basically as a marketing stunt where it's like, hey, there's 32 phases on here. They're not actually that powerful because of their thermal density, but there is 32 of them. Um, but this does work. This is, uh, this is fully capable of powering the monstrosity that is a 28-core Xeon CPU with an unlocked multiplier. Um, because that's exactly, like, that's pretty much what Intel's done here. And the thing is, so you have the 28-core Xeon, and the, the easy comparison here is the 14-core uh, i9. So I have a 7940X, and I've already tested it, uh, you know, I've benchmarked it for Cinebench and a bunch of other benchmarks. And I know for a fact that if you're running Cinebench uh, 15 on the 14 core at, say, 4.8 gigahertz, um, which my chip is not the best. There are chips out there that'll do 5 gigahertz at the voltage that mine needs for 4.8. But for 4.8 gigahertz, I need 1.35 volts. At which point my chip consumes 540 watts from the power connectors. Uh, and we will get to those eventually. So... My chip uses 540 watts for 4.8 gigahertz, 1.35 volts. Now, um, it is possible that Intel binned these Xeons like crazy to get a chip that does 5 gigahertz at 1.2 volts. However, I would like to point out that the probability of you having, like, the probability of every single core on a 28 core CPU being able to do 4.8 gigahertz, well, 5 gigahertz at, say, 1.3 volts, is a lot, lot lower than it on a 14 core CPU just because you have more cores. So the, the, the probability that this CPU was actually running five gigahertz at a reasonable voltage, very, very unlikely. But until I heard about the chiller, I thought Intel actually got away with that. But no, Intel ended up running the, the demo systems with chilled water cooling. And um, the thing is, that means they, they were definitely pushing unreasonable amounts of voltage. The other thing is Cinebench 15 on a 28-core CPU clock to 5 gigahertz finishes so fast that it's not really much of a stress test. Like, the, the fact that you finished Cinebench is really not much of an achievement when it takes a couple seconds. Um, so... The th so for, for the demo systems, the, C the CPUs were probably pushing somewhere, you know, if we go with the 28 core up here for, let's say, if, if it just, you know, if it just scaled up from my 14 core, then we're talking about 1080 watts of power. But if we went with, say, 5 gigahertz and a voltage bump to something that, uh, you know, it like th this would possibly be what it was configured to. Unfortunately, there's not much, much information on, you know, the configuration. Well, 5 gigahertz, 1.4 volts, you'd be looking at around 1,200 watts, which, uh, you know, not a huge jump in power draw, but still a hell of a lot of power. Now, if you ran something like Prime 95, you'd be looking at actually like 20% or even 30% more power than what Cinebench does, because Cinebench really isn't that heavy. Because um, it doesn't use AVX instruction, uh, AVX acceleration, and yeah, and it also it finishes quickly. So um, the the five gigahertz Cinebench demo wasn't really that you know big a stress test here. Um, nonetheless, the VRM you need is absolutely insane. And the thing is, you could probably get away with twelve hundred watts on something smaller than this. Um, so maybe they were running even more voltage than that. It's really hard to say. Uh, like, there's no information on these systems, and, and, and so... 
but we, we are definitely talking about power draw numbers in excess of a thousand watts. If they had managed to bin something that did five gigahertz 1.2 volts, you could probably see it doing around 800 watts. But, well, at least for Cinebench, under Prime 95, it would still hit a thousand. But um, with the fact that they ended up using a chiller, I'm inclined to believe that they didn't get a, you know, uber gold CPU, which does 5G on 1.2 volts, um, which with the high core count is extremely unlikely. So this VRM has to push a crazy amount of power. And so let's go over how it actually does doing that. So since the 28 core Xeon uses uh, the fully integrated voltage regulator, which is basically a very, very high frequency buck converter built directly into the silicon of the CPU and optimized for basically converting two volts into, well, um, converting your core voltage, like the, the conversion it's good for is basically a 600 millivolt drop or like a 500 millivolt drop. Um, it's not really like, it's not a fully fledged, um, it's not super flexible. It really doesn't like doing big voltage drops or very small voltage drops. It, it's optimized very specifically for a certain range. And if you go outside that range, the CPUs behave weirdly. Um, but basically for the convenient, for convenience sake, I'm going to assume that the entire time VCC in was uh, two volts because it makes my life simpler. Also because the data sheet actually ends at two volts. <laughs> so if you go beyond that, you, you get a mess. And two volts for 1.4 volts V core is actually acceptable. Even for 1.35 volts V core, uh, it is a reasonable voltage to run. You'd probably actually want to run a bit more than that, but... Nonetheless, two volts has to get, uh, so all of this, this crazy amount of power has to get out of this VRM at two volts. And that leads to some insane current draw figures. So starting at the 600 amps that the demo system might have been pushing um, for Cinebench, we're talking about a VRM heat dissipation of about 77 watts. This heatsink starts making a lot of sense, though honestly this heatsink looks big enough to cool a CPU. Um, and this VRM would probably do that 600 amps. So, well, not necessarily fully passive, but with a some airflow, you know, it, it would it should not have a problem with that because this is huge and it has a massive power plane sitting behind it. So that this all this empty space here that all acts basically as a heat sink for the power stages. So 600 amps, we're talking uh, 77 watts. That's the CPU right there. Um, now, 800 amps, which, you know, let's say Prime 95, or uh, if you got more unreasonable cooling than a water chiller, then 800 amps, definitely achievable. You know, we've seen the we've seen the 18-core CPU do 1,000 watts on liquid nitrogen. So 800 amps output for this VRM on, uh, on let's say, uh, well, I think dry ice. You'd probably be looking at dry ice because phase change cooling would run into some major issues with just the amount of heat that these that a 28 core Xeon would put out. It would overload basically most uh, phase change coolers that I've seen. Obviously, like it would basically require somebody to build a very, very big custom unit that, as far as I'm aware, nobody has anything in the power capacity that a uh, 28 core Xeon would need. So 800 amps, uh, you'd be looking at about 125 watts of heat um, coming out of the VRM, and a thousand amps. Uh, at which point, you know, the at this point, the, the 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 power supply starts being a problem because you know two two volts, thousand amps output. We're talking about what uh, two more than 2,000 watts coming into the VRM. Um, as it would produce about 175 watts of heat. So you'd be looking at like 2,200 watts input power. Uh, that would overload every PSU ever. Like, they're, they're, well, maybe not some of the crazy mining special, you know, mining only power supplies, but any normal power supply, well, normal. Su uh, Superflower has built a 2,000 watt power supply for the European market before the mining craze. Um, well, this would still overload that. So um, one thing I do wonder about this VRM is with this power connector arrangement where they have two of them up here and two of them down here, I do wonder, and also, you know, separate uh, input filtering chokes, I do wonder if the power plane for this VRM is split. And by split, I basically mean that half the VRM gets... Okay, that's not half, is it? It's really hard to guess where half on this thing is because it's so big. 
but half the VRM would be getting 12 volts from one from one set of power connectors, and the other side would be getting 12 volts from the other set of power connectors, which on a motherboard, that's actually not normal. On GPUs, your 8-pin and your 6-pin should not be in parallel, but on motherboards, your various CPU power connectors are generally going to be in parallel. In fact, having them... Sp I've not seen a motherboard where they're, where they're uh, different power planes. But here having them on different power planes would make a ton of sense, as it would mean that you can run um, two power supplies in parallel for this thing, which you'd want to, because you need to source 2,000 watts of power for the CPU. The other thing is, I'm not aware of any power supplies with two eight, four 8-pin power connectors for, for CP, like four eight, uh, EPS 8-pin power connectors. So this board might actually feature dual PSU compat uh, capabilities built into it, which uh, that's a pretty cool feature in my opinion. And I actually asked about, I actually asked if ROG was considering doing that for regular X299, since X299 is already kind of capable of like tripping over current protection on like a 1200 watt power supply. Um, but here, here it's not really optional, in my opinion. Like, if if you want to really hammer one of these CPUs when overclocking, you're gonna need two power supplies because they don't make anything bigger than 2,000 watts, and these CPUs could pull more than that. Um, anyway, so 1,000 amps, 175 watts of heat. This heat sink, uh, this heat sink, uh, you know, keeps showing why it why it's this big. Um, and then for 1,200 amps, which technically speaking, the, these are 50 amp power stages. So you should be able to push 50 amps through every single one of them, assuming this heatsink is able, able to keep up. I'm gonna, but I don't think it is able to keep up because at 1,200 amps, you'd be looking at 250 watts of heat output. That's like a GPU right there. <laughs> That's like an entire graphics card. This seems to be in the same size as a GPU heatsink, you know, but um, I, I wouldn't really... like. So past this point, I, I wouldn't really want to go because as you can clearly see, the scale, like the, the, the power increase uh, gets bigger and bigger going from each of these values. So from like 70... Uh, from 77 watts to 125, that's about 50 watts. Then from 125 to 7, 175, that's about 50 watts. And then past this point, it actually gets non-linear. Well, it it's never linear, but it starts really ramping up as you go from 175 to 250. And then from 250, you'd be looking at like over 300 watts for the next 200 amps. So uh, at, at, at around 1200 amps, I'd say is the limit for this VRM. And at two volts, that produce you know that translates into about two thousand four hundred watts of power capability. Now the twenty eight core should not actually get to that, um, at least not continuously. It might spike to that, but it shouldn't be able to pull two thousand four hundred watts uh, sustained. Partly because of cooling concerns, but partly also like if you just assume that you didn't have cooling issues, um, if you looked at the eighteen core, the eighteen core wouldn't like the the eight you if you had a 36 core right you could the, you could maybe hit 2400 well no like 2000 watts average um this is not a 36 core this is a 28 um so it shouldn't actually you know it, it shouldn't be uh it shouldn't actually get even necessarily up well 2000 watts it might be able to hit but above that def i i, I would be very very skeptical and actually, even 2,000 watts would be hard to hit because the the 18 core maxes out at around 1,000 watts for for liquid nitrogen overclocking, and so you know this 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 isn't plus like this isn't literally twice an 18 core. It's more like 55% more than an 18 core. So realistically, even on liquid nitrogen, you're probably going to land in a current output somewhere in between these two. Um, so it's not like like th this VRM is. It is ridiculously powerful, and it, in fact, it should be, which is good, because you don't really want to, you know, you never, in extreme overclocking, you don't want to be overclocking on, on the edge of what the VRM can do, because um, that leads to unexpected shutdowns, unexpectedly dead motherboards, you know, th those kinds of things. So it's nice to have some headroom. This definitely has some headroom. Um, 
but it's it's insane. <laughs> it is absolutely insane. And you know what? It is as far as I'm concerned, it is at least nice to see a 28 phase VRM where the 28 phases actually freaking work. Like these are laid out in a way that they w and have a heatsink big enough that you can actually utilize, like use them to their full, well, not necessarily full capability, but a lot. Like you can actually make use of this because there's a lot of other motherboards out there which would have, you know, on paper, the specs would be similar in terms of what components they use and what kind, of, what phase count they have. But the way the VRM would be laid out and the cooling the VRM would be given would be completely inadequate for handling these kinds of current outputs. Um, so yeah, absolutely crazy motherboard right here. Um, not not the highest phase count, but definitely the most powerful motherboard I think I've ever seen. It might even be the straight up. Actually, this is definitely the most powerful VRM I've ever seen on anything, ever. <laughs> um, because even like the super, you know, even 1080 Ti's, 980 Ti's, and 780 Ti's, which 780 Ti's were notorious power hogs. Like those cards would easily hit uh, 1500 watts power consumption on liquid nitrogen. Well, even those, uh, you know, they, they would settle for a 14 or 16 phase VRM. 980 Ti's, very similar to the 780 Ti in terms of power consumption. Again, you wouldn't see them above 16, uh, with more than 16 phases. And then there's this thing, <laughs> which is just absolutely insane because Intel lost their freaking mind. Um, and it is really, really cool that they did because th this is from, from like an extreme overclock, like as a hardware enthusiast, this is freaking awesome. As, uh, as far as practical uses go, this doesn't have any, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I can't see any good reason to get this um, or even to overclock it to the point where you would need a VRM this big because your CPU, like this VRM is going to be, you know, on a normal cooling system, this VRM is going to be like really underused because th th this is, this is, this is designed basically to run this on liquid nitrogen, which makes me wonder if Intel was originally planning to demo these on LN2 or if they plan to do an LN2 demo sometime in the future, because this board would certainly be capable of doing that as impractical as it would be to do. So, yeah, crazy, crazy VRM right here. And with the, the, the power connectors, um, each of these for a continuous uh, power, uh, for continuous power draw, a single 8-pin is good for 480 watts. But with extreme overclocking, what you need to keep in mind, the time time matters and also how much airflow you have. You can actually, if you point a fan at your cables, your cables can handle more power because they're getting cooled. Similarly, if you have, you know, airflow over your power connectors, they're getting cooled. They're not gonna, they're not gonna burn out on you when you push them beyond their recommended specifications. And also if the benchmark only lasts a couple seconds, well, it takes time for a connector to overheat and melt. So as long as you don't run anything that lasts, say, half an hour, well, okay, half an hour might be pushing it, but usually it takes like 10 minutes before you, you see, you know, see, like before you start seeing thermal issues. So, and also, well, sometimes a lot longer than that, but, you know, 10 minutes would probably be the upper limit for how long you could run a benchmark while, say, pushing 600 watts into one of these, or maybe even 700. So... The, the, t the length of your workload also matters when it comes to considering the power connectors. For a daily system, as ridiculous as it would be, this, this is plenty capable. For extreme overclocking, it would, you know, it'd be riding the edge on the power connectors, um, which is actually why the, the other board that was used for demoing the ROG one, that one had six power connectors around the C for, for the CPU VRM. Um, I, I prefer that approach. <laughs> that I think is a better. Uh, that, that I think is definitely the better option for for liquid nitrogen overclocking a t one of these twenty eight core Xeons. But for 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 this right here, um, like th this would still work, especially considering as as I also mentioned, it's actually kind of unlikely that you would see the CPU pull more than two thousand watts continuous anyway. 
or even 2000 watts continuous but it's, it's really hard to say um w without actually like having any hard you know data uh hard test data to to go off of so that's that's that now then let's cover some of the minor vrms rather quickly so this right here is vcc well i'm assuming is vccsa again i there's no information on this. We got shown pictures and some some crazy Cinebench scores, but no actual details. So this I'm assuming is VCCSA based on the fact that this is where VCCSA is located for uh, X299, and this being a you know Skylake Xeon, uh, it should be very 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 similar to X299 CPUs since those are also technically Skylake Xeons, just branded as i9s. Now. And on a smaller die, but it wouldn't really like, well, it could be VCCIO. Honestly, this could be either VCCSA or VCCIO. It wouldn't really matter where you put one of them. If Intel decided to rearrange how the pins are laid out in the socket, then you could switch them around. But for, I'm just going to go with this being VCCSA. The voltage controller for this is a 35204. And that is a three plus one phase voltage controller. And it's being severely underused here because there's just one IR3553 in the single phase VCCSA, which is fine because VCCSA um, really, even even here, wouldn't need to push that much power. It should actually need, it should push more power than it would need on, say, um, on regular Skylake X because this has more PCIe, uh, uh, more PCIe and more memory channels. But it shouldn't be hugely different, and this, like a single phase IR3553 on a, on a Skylake X system is already massive overkill. So here it's just, uh, it's still actually overkill, just not quite as much. Now then, memory power is a ridiculous three phase. Um, it seems like the trend is to just put a phase for every, you know, every channel here. Um, so you do get a three phase right here for VDDR. And that's controlled by this chip right here, which is again a 35204, and it's actually running in 3 plus 0 this time, in, uh, this time around instead of 1 plus 0. And the power stages are again International Rectifier 3553s. Um, honestly, this VRM would be more efficient if it was a single phase instead of three, <laughs> because even with three memory, like even with six uh, sticks of DDR4, um, at least non-ECC DDR4. I'm not sure if like the super high density ECC sticks pull more power, but consumer grade DDR4, which I assume if Intel is going to make this, because this is overclockable. So I'm assuming they're going to strip it of ECC capabilities and limit how much memory it can address to, you know, push it away from their server, from server people, um, from their server co customers. So for regular memory sticks, this is massive overkill because th like even with six slots right here, if they were all occupied and running at like 1.5 volts, you'd still be only looking at like eight amps output. And uh, eight amps is like just about approaching the peak of the efficiency curve for one of these, not for three of them. So for three of them, this is actually really, th this VRM is running pretty inefficient because there's too many phases. Uh, should, but you know, is fine because the heat's spread across more phases. And ultimately, your, your VRM efficiency down here doesn't matter when you have this monstrosity on the motherboard. So that's the memory power. This right here, I assume is VPP. I am not sure about the details on that. It's a supporting rail for a DDR4. Then we get what I assume is VCCIO, which is the same exact story as VCCSA, except I can't locate the voltage controller for that. It might be this. That kind of looks like it could be a 35, uh, 30, uh, 35204, um, but not 100% certain there. And up here on the other side of the board, you get more VDDR and another VPP phase right there. So basically the rest of the board is pretty, you know, pretty standard. Uh, well, the, the, the three phase memory power is uh, unique to this platform as normally you would see, uh, well, m at most two phases for memory power, but one phase per channel is also a thing. It's just, it kind of depends on how high end the motherboard is. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, uh, if you ignore the monstrosity that is the VCC, and this is a pretty normal motherboard. 
you know? <laughs> if you just ignore the the socket and the 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 VCC and VRM. Now, some other interesting things to note. There's RGB headers on this thing. There's also two postcodes, but that that's kind of, you know, that's really that's kind of a given cuz this is a prototype board using for uh used for like uh like this is probably you know, internal engineering sample, which they're actually using to test the platform. So the fact that it has postcodes is kind of just a given because that's handy to have on a prototype board, isn't it? But there are RGB headers, which is just like, well, really odd. <laughs> like that, that is, that is concerning because I don't think the are like the people who designed this board. I don't think they put those there just for you know having RGB lights on in the lab that this motherboard spends most of its time in. This this seems like Intel actually intends to one day ship this because there's really no reason for there to be more RGB down here, and this audio section looks like it's been ripped right off of a regular main like main, you know regular gaming gigabyte board. Um, there's also a BIOS switch, but I'm going to say that that's, you know, that kind of comes with this being a development board. Though it is socketed. The BIOS chip is in a socket, so... Um, this is kind of optional for, you know, a development board like this, but it, it is still there. But mostly those RGB headers and that audio section it just have me wondering, like... We might actually some see something that isn't this, because I don't think this is even ATX. It does seem to be abiding to some motherboard form factor, but it's definitely not ATX. Um, and so we might actually see this thing in, like, quotation marks retail. You know, as retail as something like this can be. Because it is so ridiculous. But yet there, yet there's RGB headers, so it seems like they actually intend to go ahead with one of these um, for normal users. Because this this doesn't look like they this doesn't really look like they took a server board and smacked a giant VRM on it. This looks more like they they just built made a monstrous motherboard that you know is just absolutely freaking insane. Um, so. This this is a thing. <laughs> this is what Intel needs to get a 28 core Xeon to do five gigahertz w without blowing the VRM to pieces. Which that Xeon would actually like if you took that 28 core Xeon and just overclocked it on water, uh, or at least ran it at the settings that Intel was demoing it at, it would probably blow up most X299 motherboards. There there's a few motherboards which would just about survive it. But most of them would get obliterated, um, which is why things like why, why this exists and why the ROG Dominus board exists. Because, well, um, regular X299 and server boards, especially not server boards, wouldn't handle this because server boards work with CPUs that have a TDP limited to 300 watts, and so they can get away with an eight phase or a six phase even. But this, this, this doesn't have limits. Um, this is the very definition of removing all limits here. Uh, but th this is just ridiculous. And it really makes me happy as an enthusiast to see it, even if I think it's also completely impractical and ridiculous. It's, th this, this is like, this is like the, the liquid, uh, uh, what liquid nitrogen is to CPU cooling, this is to CPUs and motherboards. <laughs> like, that's what this is. Because this is completely insane. And awesome. So, yeah, that's it for the video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave uh, any comments or questions down in the comments section below. Uh, it, be, if you'd like to support what we do here with uh, Gamers Nexus, then uh, there's a link to the Patreon down below. And if you'd like to see more overclock, uh, more extreme overclocking focused type content, then uh, I have a channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do that. So that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.